You're listening to the Geekscape Network. Time to fire up the VCR. This one's my favorite. Welcome to Analog Jones in the Temple of Film. I'm Steve. And I'm Matt. And we're a VHS podcast that looks at the box art trailers and behind the scenes. And then we pretend to rent them, even though we own them. What is our first of Stephen King October month, Matt? We are cracking in to Stephen King's Children of the Corn. Every child is afraid of the dark, the unknown, the nightmare. In Gatlin, Nebraska, that nightmare is in the corn. Ah! Stephen King's Children of the Corn. Praise God! Praise the Lord! Stephen King, the author of Carrie, The Shining, The Dead Zone, and Christine, an adult nightmare. Children of the Corn. I'm here, Lord! I'm ready! Stephen King's Children of the Corn, an adult nightmare. Dun, 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 dun. Sort of one of the more notorious titles in his catalog of stories and uh, film, based on a short story, of course, but uh, one of the more notorious films, probably because they are ch- child murderers in <laughs> it, but people know this movie. I don't know if everybody's seen this movie, but people know of this movie. Well, I have told you this, that I always confuse this in Village of the Dan by John Carpenter. And it's kind of embarrassing. And when I put this tape in, I was like, oh shit, it's not that film. I know I know this movie. I have seen this film before. I own all of them because I'm sick, but I've only ever seen the first two. Did you buy like a, a box set? Yeah, I did. I got, I have the first one and then I bought a set that has two through seven on it. And then uh, at the same time, I got the original for free. I got the remake. And then, I, then since then, two have come out. And I'm like, well, I have to fuck another one. They're going to buy the other two. <laughs> and you can find them for like $2. Like, they're not expensive to get. So I was like, complete the collection. So I have the third one on VHS, and I have no clue how I got it at all. I, I showed you my entire box of Stephen King VHSs. Half of those I haven't seen and have no idea where I got them. That's hilarious. Yeah, I mean, we were looking through that box. It's some good stuff in there. It's just, yeah, I don't, I don't know where you got Children of Corn 3 from. Uh, uh, me neither. <laughs> and Carrie 2, yeah. even though that's not really part of his, like like Children of the Corn 3 and Carrie 2, they're just like offsprings from yeah. his. Um, I, one of the ones when we were talking, like shopping the list around of like, talking about what Stephen King movies you're going to do for this like I have like the Mangler too which is just so random <laughs> like you have the Mangler also right yeah but like the Mangler too like, yeah I didn't even know there was a Mangler too yeah there's three Jesus <laughs> have all of them if you ever need to go down that path Oof. what well, maybe I maybe mean someday. maybe sometimes weekends get weird yeah and my weekend when I go through all the children of the corn movies is going to get super weird I think I have watched the majority of Stephen King movies like that, you know, where you just get weird with them in the winter when it's just like, you know, in Chicago when there's like 10 inches of snow and you're like, well, I ain't doing shit outside. Yeah, you just pop in a movie and that's usually a Stephen King movie. (laughs) It's true. You had seen this before, right? Or no? Yes. Yes. I had seen this many, many, many years ago. Gotcha. So, and and it is it is a bare bones VHS. Yeah, uh, I had only ever watched it on TV. I had only ever seen this on TV in the 90s. Uh, That is the the way I saw this. I had actually seen the second one first. I had seen the second one like when that came out on uh, VHS and 
as as a kid renting horror VHSs, you didn't care what number it was. You like Puppet Master Four? Sure, let's let's go for it. Just Whatever. Two? Sure, I want to see some kids fuck some shit up. Like I don't care what number it is, just give me the gore. Like <laughs> I know, and I think this one too. I get other. I've seen the second and third. I think, but there's so many. Yes. That like I I think I had this obviously I think I took Village of the Damned Children of the Corn one through three and jammed them into one movie and created it and then when I got into this film and there's the famous character of Isaac I was like oh he's in this one <laughs> uh, jamming them all together probably made it a better experience <laughs> because like yeah. outside of Children of the Corn two which I really like. None of those movies are good. <laughs> Even, sorry, Carpenter, your Village of the Damned is probably your worst movie. So, And I've seen Ghosts of Mars, and I think Village of the Damned might be worse. Ghosts of Mars is at least very, very entertaining. A little. Uh, the first half is. The second half, you're just like, okay, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm just tired. <laughs> well, I guess you have to know how I use very, very entertaining. It's just like, holy shit, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Uh, it's like uh, it's like Carpenter fell asleep at the wheel and just like yes. dragged all the other characters with him, like yes. just like hitting every fence post he could. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, we already went through the history of this, so let's get into like the dime store uh, info on this. Children of the Corn released on March ninth, March ninth, nineteen eighty four, on a budget of eight hundred thousand dollars. But to their credit, they made fourteen point five in the box office. Everybody knew this movie. Yeah. Everybody knew this. Well, I, I wonder too, at this point, is this when Stephen King, no matter what you put his name on, it was going to sell? Yeah, he was unfucking touchable at this time. And we said it was based on one of his short stories of the same title, directed by Fritz Kirschisch, which basically just did a bunch of direct to video movies after this. He looked like just one of Roger Corman's people. People. Uh, he did direct some episodes of the Swamp Thing TV series, which I... Ooh, I love that show. Yeah, it was the US, USA Swamp yeah, Thing. Yeah, I, I remember, love that show. <laughs> I, I remember those commercials creeped me out as a kid. That's oh, why right. I watched. That's why I watched. Nice, yeah. yeah. So, uh, Swamp Thing didn't creep me out, but Creature from the Black Lagoon did similarly. <laughs> so I get what you're saying, because mm-hmm. I had a similar thing with that, but... What's well, the same show? The Tales from the Crypt. It creeped me out, and that's why I watched it. Yeah. I was, just, I was like attracted to what horrified me. Yeah, funny, absolutely. Uh, distributed by the one and only wonderful New World Pictures. Yes, Roger Corman's like kind of like big budget company. It's the more I find out about it, I I actually call it Roger and Jean Corman's because yeah. she, she, his wife, had the influence. Yeah, she did a lot. Yeah, I'm impressed. Um, but she's always behind the scenes. Oh, yeah. Roger Corman is the rock star. She's yeah. the one to get shit done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, man. Starring Linda Hamilton. This is awesome. She released this the same year as Terminator. Terminator came out in, Terminator came out in October, and this came out in March. Nice. nice. How about that? How, what a year. Yeah. Well, also, talk about... Do, like two really probably different releases because Children of the Corn came out with a big name attached to it as Stephen King so maybe the release of that was a little bit bigger but like Terminator I don't know how well known James Cameron was in 84 but after it he would never be forgotten right yeah no I don't. he wasn't anybody he was another Roger Corman person yeah I do wonder if he had like less of a like a release on opening night for Terminator because just no one knew him, mm. and then they're like, "Oh, Bill, was that snowball?" <laughs> yeah. and word of mouth. Yeah, it was. Oh man, what a lovely movie. Even the eyeball scene. I don't care. I like it. I love it. Fucking perfect. So we also had Peter Horton. Who gives a shit who he is? He's from Thirty Something. I found out. I don't know. Did you watch that show? No. Me neither. <laughs> I know he's still working. He's like directing now, like oh, TV, okay. like TV series oh, and stuff. Good, good I don't know. Him. Yeah, uh, this is the tidbit before we get into the box art and the trailer here. Stephen King's script for this was rejected, and Roger Corman finally found a quote that said, "The reason we didn't take his script, and you know how proper yeah, he is. Yeah. The reason we didn't take his script was it wasn't violent enough and simply didn't make sense." <laughs> I was like. <laughs> That's like Roger Corman dropping the mic on you because, like, <laughs> he just doesn't like he's so proper. 
for a man that produces so much schlock, yeah. he like doesn't swear. Right, and... <laughs> right. It simply didn't make sense. <laughs> I like can hear him say it. Yeah. It's so good. One little like weird tidbit though, that to link onto that, the remake and the 08 TV movie remake mm-hmm. uses his script though. Really? Yeah. I haven't seen it though, so I can't comment if it doesn't make any sense. But the 2008 remake uses wow. his old script. I mean, they could also take that script and just like, let's change it, not say anything. Well, it's probably like Stephen King's name is on this. Let's yeah. just use the bones of this and call it a Stephen King script. Like, <laughs> uh, who, I, I kind of want to watch it after watching the original, but I kind of don't want to waste my time to. <sighs> I'm doing them all. I'm doing it all for you guys <laughs> so that someday in like four years I can report to you and be like I watched all the Children of the Corn movies I'm forever different now <laughs> <laughs> oh you are a crazy man you want to break down this box art for him let's take a look at this guy so this is a uh, Star Maker re-release uh, which Anchor Bay worked with them in the old days back before Anchor Bay kind of blew up they were working with uh, Star Maker and uh RG video. So this is that, that re-release. Uh, a lot of these Star Maker re-releases have the gold like frame around them. Mm-hmm. I have a uh, creep show too from them from the Star Maker. They just re-released a lot of the New World Pictures stuff in the '90s. So, like when New World <clears throat> Pictures folded in the '89 or whatever, Star Maker came and picked up all their stuff to release on video in the '90s. I do admit their stuff sticks out well if you're you know actually laying these all out on like a media cabinet. Yeah, no, the top with the gold looks <clears throat> awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But the the picture within the gold is the iconic poster that everybody mm-hmm. knows from this movie, which is the scythe. Is that a yeah. scythe or is that a sickle? That's a scythe, right? I think it's a scythe. This one's a scythe. Sickle's the more circular. Yeah, I think okay. the sickle is the one that's like on the Russian flag, right? Yeah. Or the old yeah. Soviet so Union. This is I don't know, whatever. Got it. Whatever. Whichever one. It's a scythe in the air, red sky. And it says from the author of Carrie, The Shining, Dead Zone, and Christine, which were all the movies that had come out Mm -hmm. before this and were huge hits. Stephen King's Children of the Corn, An Adult Nightmare. Uh, And then at the bottom, you see the corn, and within the corn, there are children with weapons like scythes and pitchforks with uh, glowing green eyes. And they're like painted. They're not actual kids. They're like painted images hidden in the corn. And it has a tagline of, and a child shall lead them. The bottom half is black. The arm that's up in the air is black. The side is black. But the sky is red. Nice juxtaposition. Great poster. Yeah, that's a really good poster. Uh, it's not one I'd ever want to own or anything like that. But just looking at it, very striking. Fantastic contrast. Good job. Yeah, I think if I knew nothing about this movie at all, ever, didn't know Stephen King was, nothing. Blank slate. And I saw this poster, I'd be like, yeah, I can pick that up. I have to check that out at least. Oh yeah, this poster makes you want to rent it. So it does its job and it might be better than the film. Yeah, we'll get into that in a second. Yeah. <laughs> uh, flipping it over to the back, yeah, it has the Anchor Bay thing. So this is when Anchor Bay started working with Star Maker. And uh, we got two images, one of Lyndall Hamilton and one of Peter Horton with the uh, little girl uh, whose name is Sarah, I believe in the movie. Sure. <laughs> I just I just watched it, so things are fresh, but they're also just things that are gone now. <laughs> I can't remember the little kid's name in it. I think it, is it Zach? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that wouldn't be a biblical name. It's probably like Zachary. Oh uh, fuck. It's gone. I, I don't know. Whatever. Uh here's your description if you've never heard or seen Children of the Corn. The children are watching, waiting, and hiding. Stephen King's shocking thriller. It began on a quiet Sunday in Gatlin, Nebraska. That was the day the children slaughtered the grown-ups. Isaac, the boy preacher, told told them that he who walks behind the rows was pleased. And three years later, the children still follow Isaac and his evil teenage disciple, Malachi. When a young couple traveling across country accidentally drive into Gatlin, they begin to discover the town's terrible secrets. However, what they don't realize is that they have become part of the children's bloody mission, a mission that cannot be fulfilled until the two intruders are dead. All right. Yeah, that was... Uh, that's actually... That kind of synopsis is fine for that's this a good film. Synops- yeah, that's, that's, that's a good... Yeah. About. Like, that is a good synopsis. I didn't expect the synopsis to be that good, so I was like, oh... Fuck. <laughs> yeah, no, like, that's a good synopsis. That's what this movie's about. And I think it's enticing. If I read that synopsis without knowing what this movie's about, I'd be like, whoa, the kids turn on the adults? I gotta see this. 
I think this entire VHS box art is enticing. That's all it has to do. It just has to entice you to rent it once. Yeah, and I mean, seeing like Linda Hamilton on the back, you know it's kind of got some star power. I would pick this up. Mm -hmm. Easy. Easy. I would too. I probably did as a kid. I just can't remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I th my only kind of memory of this movie as a kid before seeing it was sort of like the, the mystique of knowing that there was a movie out there where like the kids kill all the adults that live in a town where it's just the kids. Did you see on the side here? It has like 1401. Yeah, I don't know if that was just like a rental thing. I don't know if it's the rental or the maker. I assume rental, but yeah, so I don't know. 1401 sticker on the side. I don't know if that's all about. Ah, the weird stickers you find when you pick up VHSs in the modern age. <laughs> yeah, part of the, the fun. I don't uh, take them off. I leave them on. I, yeah. Unless they're like covering something up. Yeah. But, I mean, most of the time they'll destroy the box, so I just don't. Yeah, I just leave them. And they're part of the history, so. So we slide this tape in, and we find, one, there's no trailer, so we go right into the feature presentation. Yes. And now, our feature presentation. And, uh, ooh, uh, this is... So it starts off with a kid narrating, and it says three years earlier. I really don't like it when films do this. I have a problem with three years earlier. Tell me the year. Yeah. Because if you say present day, that's 2018 right now, watching this movie. Yeah. You immediately date your movie. Like, tell me the year. Just give me the year. Be like 1981, 1984, done. And now I know where we're at. Well, they're always scared, like, oh, we don't want to date our movie. But your movie is dated. It doesn't matter. It's always going to... I, there's hardly any movies that are timeless. It's so hard that, like, just... Accept it. Yeah. No, just, I think your movie's more watchable if you just say the year, as opposed to saying present yeah. day, because I'm immediately, like, for a second, like, this ain't present day. Yeah. This is 1984. <laughs> I was trying to figure out, I go, is this supposed to be the 50s, the 60s, yeah, the 70s? Right? right? Um, I don't... So, uh, the kid's narrating, and he's like, oh, you know, I was the only kid at church that day, because Isaac took the rest of the kids into a cornfield, and my dad doesn't like Isaac, and then we go to a diner, and I'm like... What? I think I would actually, it is a little jarring, but this feels very Stephen King to me. To have like a kid narrating this story, if this is the most Stephen King thing in this, I think. Why do we even have to, don't narrate this. You don't even need to narrate. If you just show it a kid leaving church and then being slaughtered at the diner, which they are, more interesting. Oh yeah, I agree. But I just, I think the choice to have the... The overdubbing, which is cheap and easy and bad writing and everything like that, it does at least feel very Stephen King movie-ish. Oh, I agree with that. That, is, I, that yeah. is something that translates a lot from his books to movies, is a narrator. Uh, so I tried to figure out, and I'm going to ask you, do you know why we killed the adults? Because Isaac told them to. But do you know why Isaac told them? Like, how he convinced them? I had no idea until I read the notes today. What? what, is, what because is there that? was no corn in a harvest. Like, they had oh. a bad harvest, so he's just like... The I feel like it is alluded to now in the movie. I don't not, remember it. Not strongly enough where I could pick up on that. <laughs> I don't recall it at all. Like, I, and I wouldn't have known unless I read, like, this, you know, the full synopsis of this mm -hmm. film. Basically the entire story. And I'm like, What? The uh, Amish Mafia that comes and kills the adults with knives and sugar poison. Yes. Um, I, you know what? I was kind of like, oh, look at that. They're having kids kill adults. I think that's interesting. But some of those shots are just like... There is one shot in particular where someone rises up with a machete in their hand. And you know, you're probably getting the image of how you hold a machete in your hand. All right, And you're about to chop a piece of meat. They hold it like limp and then come down and hack. Why did the director take that shot? Because like it's it's probably limp because it's a child holding it. But right? still but it, like why yeah, why use that in the movie? Like, you know. Yeah, just uh, I, I, well the kid when the blood splattered on him when he was drinking his milkshake, I so if this is a comedy, he would have got splatted with the blood and like looked stunned and then slowly creeped in and took a sip out of his straw. Yeah. <laughs> I was waiting for it. Yeah, right. I wish that happened. <laughs> I I do uh, as much. I, I, I've got a ton of problems with this movie. 
I actually love this opening scene, though. Really? Because yeah. I thought this was going to be a different movie when that scene happened. I was like, oh, fuck. Like, we're already in this. The adults are dead. It's pretty graphic. You know, it's 80s movie graphic. Mm-hmm. It's not, like, hostile movie graphic, but it's graphic. Um, and, like, it's 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 well-paced, I think, that scene. Mm-hmm. Which the rest of the movie is not, <laughs> but like I really, I really like this opening scene, and I was like, "Oh, is this better than I well, remember it being?" Well, compared to the next thirty minutes, this scene's amazing. Exactly, that is my next point. We get we get some pretty cool credits too with the with, uh, credits over the drawings. I like that too. Yeah, I, I guess establishing that we have a, a psychic kid in this. Yeah, which of course Stephen King has to put a psychic kid in. Yes, of course, like that just. Okay. Of course. I don't even know if the psychic kid is useful in this. I don't even know if the psychic kid is psychic. If they just, uh, yeah, if they're know. convinced that this kid is psychic, but like, she's she drawing, really... yeah, she's drawing pictures, and I don't remember her like foreseeing anything. It was just like she's drawing what's already happened, and I'm like, what? Yeah, she's psychic. It's like I could be psychic too for what happened five minutes ago. <laughs> but maybe I missed something and didn't pick it up because I was so fucking bored. Yeah, because we get so we get an opening scene that I really like, and then we get the credits that I think are pretty good, and then the movie slams on the brakes, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we move glacially uh, back to the town. We get introduced to I don't even know these two characters' names. I don't. I know. I don't. I know Sarah's the girl that is the psychic. That is the yeah. name. And Lin- then I so can now, God, those are the ones. We'll just say Linda Hamilton. We'll say Linda and Peter. Yeah, Linda that's, Hamilton yeah. and Peter Horton. Yeah, because yeah, uh, and it, I guess Peter doesn't want to commit and marry her. She's like begging him. They go on a road trip to move. Now they're going to somewhere in the West Coast, but I guess what they're doing right here is driving through Omaha. Or they're, they're driving through Nebraska, right. which, by the way, what's up, Omaha friends? <laughs> I know you're listening. Um, so they drive through and they get stuck here. And then I realized, wait, this is three years later. You mean to tell me no one has drove through this town, stopped and seen kids? Or did they just slaughter them all? Does it matter? <laughs> I'm yawning as you're asking me. <laughs> because I immediately shot back into the film. Um yeah, I don't know the logistics of it. And there's so many other questions like, when these kids become adults, do they need to die? How would there then be kids? Because the kids are not procreating. So, like, where are kids coming from? It's like, there's a lot of questions here. Is there nobody else coming through the town ever for three years until these people? like? And what? how long can they maintain this? Because we, we find out later in the film, when you turn 19, you get killed and sacrificed to the corn god yeah but like how will there be more kids then if i know just, they like would just eventually kill everyone then like would it just be like jacob or isaac left like hey shit i don't have anyone else yeah hey no one's listening to me because i'm the only one left. <laughs> yeah uh, i don't i don't know the logistics of this but yeah they seem to drive through nebraska for what seems like seven states because they are driving for so long. I, I am interested in the kids' story, especially because we see the two kids, Sarah and her brother, who don't want to be part of the cult. And then we see the cult in action and like Malachi's nuts. And we get some good stuff, I think, with the kids. Every time it switches back to Linda Hamilton and Peter Horton, who are giving fine performances, they just have nothing to do. And I am so bored every well, time we come back to them. It's like small it's like small talk, but the small talk doesn't add up to anything. It's like, I don't care about these characters. I don't, they, they mean nothing. Like they're making fun of a, a preacher, which is obviously Stephen King because yeah. religion and yeah. he's going to mock it. And I, I get that, but it's it's dead. And it, I don't know these characters, so I don't care. Like, yeah. It's like, yeah, they're mocking religion, and it's like kind of funny because they're mocking like cultish religion. So it's like it's funny, but like. I don't know these people, well, do and I don't like these people because they just seem to bicker the whole movie. Well, he doesn't want to commit, and she's desperate to get married. That's her entire character. Well, his entire character is he doesn't want to get married, and he's a doctor. That's it. That's it. Their, their characters it. are so, sh- like, just one layer. It's yeah. bad. And I think that is what pumps the brakes so hard in yeah. this movie, is that I don't care about these characters at all. No, you should have made them likable in this car ride and they're not likable in fact they're boring which is the worst 
Yeah, like I said, every time it cuts yeah. back to them, I'm like, fuck. But just show me the kid's story. <laughs> uh, yeah, and well, kudos to the director and filmmaker. So the kid is running away with a suitcase, and he's trying to get away from Alex and all these psychopaths. Uh, and he gets hit by Linda Hamilton and Horton, Horton. Peter Horton, and they fucking run over. I mean, he flips over the car. Oh, they blasted. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Yeah, it's it like shit like this is what's good in the movie. Like the violence is good in this movie. Like it's effective. It's a, it's a jolt to the system. Yeah, like they they rock that kid. <laughs> they they send him in the air and they like pummel him. But, like, he's dead already, obviously, because yeah, they, Malachi killed him in the cornfields because he was trying to escape. Yeah, and the doctor, he, he notices, he's like, I didn't kill him, I just, I, <laughs> I don't know what he says, but I guess they wrap him up, put him in the back of the car, bump into a random old guy who is useless. This old guy made me mad because he's like, what? No, I don't do nothing. Go that way. I don't know. Don't go to that time. Like, there's some, for some reason, his speech patterns or whatever he was doing, I was like, I hate this old man. <laughs> I mean, effective, because I'm sure they don't want you to like this character, but like, yeah, just so stupid. It's like, I don't have gas. You can only use my bathroom if you're buying gas. <laughs> and I don't have gas. And he's like, and I don't have a phone. And I'm like, well, where's the nearest town? And he's like, 20 miles away. And he's like, well, what about the science for Gatlin? He's like, you don't want to go there. And that's like, yeah. yeah. I'm like, I just, when he was talking, I'm like, I don't like you. Like, yeah. And, and then uh, he's got a dog, which naturally dies because it's an 80s movie. And uh, that's also another reason I was like, you couldn't even keep your dog alive. But if he's lived next to this town for three years, why are they killing him now? Just because he had contact with the other people, I'm assuming. The, like, I think that was, oh my gosh, is that the first person he's talked to in three years? Probably. Or more? He, look at how he's, he's talking to his dog like it's the only person he has, so... Maybe. I do not want to live that life. I don't want to live in Gatlin, Nebraska. I'll tell you that much. Omaha's fun. I believe it. I stopped in, like, uh, Nebraska when we were going to Colorado, and I liked it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, what's, what's the one next to it? Is that Iowa that's over there? Uh, yeah. Iowa Iowa sucks. (laughs) Never been. (laughs) I drove through it. I, and I'm I'm dreading my drive through it again this October. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh man, <laughs> I'm just imagining it's boring as shit. There's nothing. It is three hours or four hours or however long it is of nothing. So it's like Southern Illinois when I have to drive home to Missouri. Yes. Woo, yes. that is boring. Yes. Oh, let's go back to not ripping those two states, even though it's kind of fun. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I wrote down my note is Isaac is the best thing in this movie. And then parentheses, oh, by the way, he's 25 in this movie. Is he really? Yeah, his name is John Franklin. I knew he had a thing where he looks. Yes. You know, like, yeah, like, like he a younger just, kid and uh, he's old. I didn't know that he was 25, though. So I just thought he was like a teenager or something. He's got amazing camera presence. He's amazing. In this yeah. Movie. What has the Lord commanded? In the dream, the Lord did come to me, and he was a shape. It was he who walks behind the rose. And I did fall on my knees in terror and hide my eyes, lest the fierceness of his face strike me dead. And he told me all that has since happened. He said, Joseph has taken his things and fled this happy place because the worship of me is no more upon him. So take you his life and spill his blood like what upon the earth. But let not the flesh pollute the corn. Cast him instead upon the road. And so it was done. Joseph the betrayer was cast out. And he who walks behind the rose did say, I will send outlanders amongst you, a man and a woman. And these outlanders will be unbelievers and profaners of the holy. I wish I should never came here. But he's always been here, just like he who walks behind the rose. And the man shall sorely test you, for he has great power, even greater than that of the blue man. The blue man! Yes, the blue man! And just as the blue man was offered up unto him, so shall be the unbelievers. Make sacrifice unto him. Bring him the blood of the outlander. Praise God! Praise the Lord! Praise God! 
Like the moment he's like the iconic image that you guys all know from this movie is him looking through the window in the diner at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. I was just like, damn, this guy's fucking on fire. Like this, yeah, and and Courtney Gaines too, who kind of got some horror, you know, traction after this movie. Is that Malachi? Like that. Yeah, it's pretty great too. Yeah, he really likes his hair. You can tell he brushes it a lot. Yeah, he's got some perfectly eighties fluffy hair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, my next note is, how did he convince them to do all this? Candy? <laughs> I'm like, because the place looks like they have no food. They're living in this town for three years with no one. And I'm like, are you just, like, living on corn? And then, like, what does your butt smell like? <laughs> oh. I press oh, Yeah. Take a bath. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so when they, they're driving... Okay, because I don't understand what they're, these characters are trying to do. Because they're, like, driving away. And then they're like, oh, look. I saw someone in that house. So I'm going to stop and just walk into the house. Well, I think this whole time they're looking for a phone. All they want to do is find oh, a phone that's right. so they yeah. can call the police about the kid. And, you know, they're like, I'm going to go. I'm not going to go to Gatlin. I am going to go to Gatlin. Here's some people. There's people here. There's got to be a phone. So then they stop, right. which is seemingly unending. <laughs> they're like, wow. they're like they, yeah, they find, the, <laughs> they find the kid and they're like, oh, what are you doing? Drawing? And then they're like mortified at what she's drawing. And then he leaves. And I'm like, what? Yeah. To go to like the town to go to like the square school. Square? school? Well, first he goes to like the school to try to find somebody. All the while Linda Hamilton is back at the house and she just drew a fucked up picture of her getting killed and then all like Malachi and his followers come into the house and take her. Which by the way, if she is a psychic, she's a terrible one because spoilers, she don't die. <laughs> um bad so, psychic, bad. Bad psychic kid. Yeah, they take her and they've got her like cru- like crucified. They got her on like the corn cross, which is cool. Yeah, yeah, all the, yeah, all the religious because they like have like the zombie Jesus <clears throat> picture in the background, and they have like all these like uh, different graffitied and uh, ruined sort of religious iconography up, and all that shit looks really cool. Like the production designer did a great job on all those because they look cool. They look like Halloween type. You know, perfect to kick off our October yeah. month. They look like Halloween type paintings, and those are those are cool. But all that stuff works. Well, okay. I must have missed some stuff here because I I have. Is this the guy from Return of the Living Dead cutting his chest? Yes, That's, yes, and I think it is. I think, I think it, it is. is. Yeah. I was like, where the fuck do I know that guy from? Where do I know him from? Where do I know him from? And then finally, I was like, I picture him being a goofball. I picture him trying to get laid. And I was like, oh, I'm trying to live dead. <laughs> and then before that, I put Malachi and Isaac are having a lover's quarrel. Because yeah. Malachi basically just, you know, manhandles him, knocks him down to the ground, and then puts Isaac into the field. Or no, does he tie him up to the cross too? And then like the the CG goop comes out, covers him. And then he's taken in the cornfield and he's gone, or at least you think. And that was the point of the film where I go, wait a minute, this is real? I ground out. (laughs) (laughs) This is about the point in the movie where you lose me. (laughs) So you checked out. I'm trying to stay with this. I I will be honest. I had to pause when... So after the girl and the, the guy from Return of the Living Dead is cutting his chest, I paused this. I'm like, oh my God. Where is this going? So when I came back, and you know how you get your second wind, yeah. and I'm watching this, I go, wait, it's real? And that's the choice they made? <laughs> it's awful. Uh, and then, like, I don't know, the, the guy is running away from Malachi. There's a chase that is boring. We get to the end. Malachi rises. Or not Malachi. Um, Isaac rises and kills Malachi. But that's not the end of the film, which I thought it would be. Because I was like, I guess he's like possessed by the demon. Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, I don't even know what this is. I don't know if it's like a corn god. I don't know if it's a demon. Well, I, I think we... This uh, this seems very Stephen King again. I think we purposely don't know what it is. Yeah. But it is. He's possessed now. 
Well, it's hard to translate to to film because in film, like, if you would have had an entity, you know, like a fucking scarecrow, maybe. Yeah, something you've established earlier yeah. in the film yes. that would make sense. It would enter the scarecrow, control it, and then like it, you know, that would be its vessel. Then you could have had something because we understand. It's not really, you know, the scarecrow. It's a demon inside of it. And it would have looked cool. No, instead they do the CG blob. And then at the end they're like, "Uh uh-oh, the storm's brewing from the thing behind the corn. What is it called? The man behind the rose. I I think you just... He who walks behind the rose. Is it rose or rose? Like rose of corn? Rose W. Yeah, Yeah, okay. Rose S. All right. Um... (laughs) So that happens, the storm comes, and then they essentially just burn the field down. I mean, they're trying their hardest to build up, like, tension with it. They're like, oh, no, can we light the Molotov cocktail? Can we not? And I think they have a lighter that is a callback from earlier in the film. I can't recall. She gives them a lighter. Something like that. And then they burn the field down, and then the animated puff of smoke comes together, and and it ends really abruptly <laughs> like they walk to That's the car like the end. they walk to the car and they get their classic like last scare in because the girl like one of the few girls in this that I remember she like busts out of the car and she's like uh, you can't leave or something and then they just like they either slap her or like smack the door into her face and then it's like the end yeah yeah, it has like the the sort of American World in London ending where it's like the story's over, bye, go home. <laughs> yeah, it's just like oh, okay. I was I was gonna point out because like one of the things I do remember, even though like I browned out during this part of the movie, is I love the storm clouds look because it happens also in the scene with the gas station person before he gets killed. He sees like the clouds kind of doing a weird thing. You run out during this part. <laughs> I yeah, can see I, on your face. You have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> nope. Uh, my <laughs> hatred of the old man blinded yes. me from the sky. But they, yeah, they do the storm cloud thing, and I think that's cool. I like that aspect of the movie. But uh, yeah, it is. It is what it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I do remember the the main guy like slapping Mordecai on the ground. Mm. And I was just cracking up because yeah. I'm like, this is supposed to be like the most dramatic point in this movie or, you know, something like that. And I'm just laughing because he's slapping Mordecai. Yeah. Because <laughs> he's is, not punching him close fist. He's right. slapping him. And, and what is, even though the, the actor is 25, they're like kind of depicting him as like a 12 year old boy. And it's yeah. like this 12 year old boy smacking this like 16 year old around. It's just like this very tall. Apparently, sixteen-year-old. It's the whole thing is just. I I don't really have much like this. This is a short one because I don't have much more to say about this. It's it's boring. It doesn't move quick, and there's not enough Isaac. He's back in one of the sequels. I know that. Uh, yeah, I, I heard that. I, I read it in something, and I'm like, oh, okay, maybe I'd watch that one, just to see what he yeah. looks like, how he's aged, but. Ooh, yeah, you made me yawn, Stephen, <laughs> Stephen King's Children of the Corn. So, yeah, you know what? I'm going to list all the uh, all the sequels because, fuck it, I wrote them down. Yeah, these are these are the ten movies you could watch in the Children of the Corn franchise. 1984, the original Children of the Corn. 1992, so we had quite a bit of a break. The Final Sacrifice. Love that film. Check it out. It's <laughs> Nin- better than this one. <laughs> 1995, Urban Harvest, which has an uncredited... Charlize Theron. Yes, she's like a student sitting like in a classroom early on in the film. Uh, 1996, The Gathering. 98. Starts. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, 98, Fields of Terror. That's Eva oh. Mendez is in that one. Okay. 99, 666, oh, Isaac's Return. I think I found the one he returns yeah, in. That one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wrote that down earlier and I didn't even remember. Yeah. Block that. Uh, 2001 Revelation 2009 which there's an 8 year gap they did the TV movie remake which is based more on Stephen King's script according to Matt 2011 Genesis which sounds like a prequel I don't know I have it didn't watch it 2018 Runaway yes which I actually hear pretty good it came it did come out uh, from that same time when 
they did uh, Hellraiser Judgment, which was the most recent Hellraiser movie. It's that same thing where the Weinsteins thought they were going to lose the rights, and they had to quickly make a movie to keep the rights. Then the Weinsteins folded, and it ended up coming out, you know, later than planned or whatever. And Judgment's pretty good. I've seen that, and I hear that Runaway is actually pretty good, too. I'll take your word for it, because I doubt I'll ever watch it. I'm going to do them all, guys, and I'll report back in when I do. <laughs> may take forever. <laughs> it may kill me. <laughs> so since we have some extra time, let's talk about the newest movie we just both watched, The Predator 2018. You found him in Mexico. Daddy suggests they attract prey. A ranger sniper made first contact. He's being evaluated. You shove me again, I'm gonna break your neck. It's the loony bus. We told you. Why are you here? I had a run in with a space alien. <laughs> That's the thing that killed my man. It'll take us one by one. So come and get us. Directed by Shane Black and written by Shane Black and Fred Decker, correct? Yes. So these two come back, rejoin. They are good, good friends. Yes, they wrote Monster Squad together, and then uh, Shane Black went on to have a very exciting action career after Lethal Weapon, and Fred Decker went on to do uh, RoboCop 3. (laughs) And boom. Yeah. And then basically just became a script cleaner upper yeah. I think is what uncredited script doctor script doctor yeah yeah um I mean I fucking worship the ground that Fred Decker walks on so like I'm not making fun of him in any way he's very much he is a really good speaker like just to hear him talk and his stories loved it yeah he's a fucking amazing I I asked him in uh, monster squad if he came up with all the jokes or was it like ad lived or anything and he goes who said that? Who asked that? I, I was like, I raised my hand. He goes, I wrote every damn one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> the rest of the questions apparently didn't get his attention. But, but the one that like touched his ego, like, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, he, he was very entertaining when he came to Chicago and I saw him. Yeah, he's awesome. I love Fred Decker. And I'm glad it warmed my heart to see his name on the big screen again. I hope he gets more. Uh, you know, this movie's not being received well. No, and uh, we're we're recording this right after it came out, and it had a number one opening, but a very low number one opening at the box office. I think it only came up at twenty five million, and it cost like something like sixty million to make. So they have not made their budget back yet, even though it was a number one release this week. It did not take off like they thought it was going to. No, and it got... Oh, man. Uh, critics are not being kind, so they're not helping the word of mouth. Yeah, my, my whole thing is, I don't know what they're expecting out of a Predator movie. <laughs> because all the movies, there there are a certain kind of way that, you know, typically are not critically well-received outside of the first one. Two bombed critically, uh, Predators bombed critically... This one is now Bobby Cre- I, I don't know what they're expecting. I think only AVP, the first one, did well. And, I mean, that wasn't critically received well, but I think oh, financially. Oh, that Yeah, that yeah. made... So I think that's the only one. Because I don't think the first Predator made a ton in theater, but it made a shit ton on VHS. Yeah, it's... I don't, again, I don't know what the expectation is with these Predator movies. Like, what you see is what you get with them, man. And, like... I gotta say, I I enjoyed this new one. I enjoyed Predator. My checklist was like this. One, ragtag group of soldiers saying inappropriate things. Fucking shit up. Check. Got it. Two, a Predator blowing shit up and looks badass. I got one of the two on that. We'll talk about the super Predator. Uh, And then that's it. Yeah, that's all I need. I need action and a funny dialogue. That's all I need in these movies. And uh, I, 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 I wish I got more funny dialogue. There was a little bit... It was for a movie that was written by two people that I consider two of my favorite writers. There's a lot of exposition in here in the writing. And I wonder if that is the sort of result of all the extensive reshoots that this movie had to go through or what. But like, I wish there was more funny dialogue in it. Like I wish... Because when we do it, does. Get it, it's so fun. 
the the pacing suffers in this because they're talking so much about setting up. It sounds like they're world building for two to three other films or for at least one other film, maybe three in their minds if it was successful because they're like putting down so much crap. So they get into like the DNA splicing, which they show in the trailer. They get into, I don't know, just trying to create the most ultimate predator. That's what I heard in the trailer in this. And I'm like, I don't really care about that because it reminds me of Jurassic World. Yeah, it's like, just give me the predator. You don't need to give me a mega predator. Just give me the predator. Yeah. That's all I need. Because <laughs> um, we do get the uh, uber predator or whatever they call it in this movie. And I do not like it as much as the regular predator. No, I don't like the uber predator uh, pretty much at all. Yeah, it's it's unfortunately mostly CGI. It's not as cool looking as our classic one. I don't need it. I don't need it. Yeah. Uh, I, I do. So someone said it and it perfectly kind of like encapsulates how I feel about this film. It started with this movie hit all the Predator notes. The problem is all the other stuff got in the way. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that's it. You got you gave me that bus scene where they're introducing the soldiers saying inappropriate things and it was hilarious. You gave me Olivia Munn sticking up for herself and being actually kind of a really cool character that I thought was a big bonus. I thought she at certain points stole the show. Uh, you gave me the bad guy who was kind of like quote unquote the corporate bad guy. Yeah, we get it's uh, Sterling K. Brown in this movie and he is fucking amazing in this movie. Yeah, he's chewing scenery and gum all at the same time. <laughs> the the chewing scenery he does is encapsulated in the actual chewing he does throughout the entire yes. movie. He is literally chewing through scenes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's wonderful. It's wonderful. I love him. And I needed more story I came around in this movie. And we got the Predator fucking shit up, the first one, and running away. And it was kind of like... A fish out of water because instead of like, so we've gotten the predator in the jungle, we've gotten the predator in the urban area of 1997, which they do list both. They reference, yes, yeah. yeah. And we got the predator again. Do we count AVP? Let's not, let's throw those out. Uh, and we got the predator in its own planet. So yeah. now we get the predator at kind of like suburbs slash government for facilities. Basically, yeah. Basically, Predator in the suburbs. And what it, do you do when there's... It's not a heat wave. Yeah. And it's not, like, crime-ridden, like, LA 9097. It is quiet, sleepy suburbs. What does the Predator do? And I'm like, this is a fucking awesome setup for a movie. Well, he's blowing shit up and having fun. He or she, I don't know how these work, but... You, ha- you got it. You hit it all. The problem is it's filled with so much other shit that you're like, wait, what? Yeah, that that I think that's a good encapsulation of the movie because that's that's how I feel too. It's like, I love the fun stuff I got. I love yeah. the fun stuff I got. I just didn't need any of the other stuff. The main guy in this is a blank slate. The sniper who... I, I liked guy. him. I think he gave us a little bit he more did. than the typical blank slate. He was He was... Fine, he led the movie fine. He did his job. I didn't think he was anything superb because they don't really give him much to be superb about. Yeah, but I think he's good. But I felt like he cared for his child. And I think he's a good actor because like... Oh, okay, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. He, you know, we had the blank slate with Adrian Brody in the last movie in Predators and it didn't work, I, in my opinion. I like Adrian Brody, but I just think there's nothing going on in that performance. This, there was a little something to cling on to. And he kind of looked like that uh, Charlie Hunnam, who's on Game of Thrones, or not Game of Thrones, Sons of Anarchy, that's been in everything lately. Mm-hmm. He's been popping up. I fucking can't stand him. Like, I just think he's a terrible actor. So I was glad they went with somebody who kind of looks like him, but was like a good actor <laughs> well, in this movie. This is the actor from Narcos. He's also in Logan. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, arm in Logan. He's, he's fucking f- awesome in Logan. <laughs> he's great in Logan. Yeah. I mean, that that this guy knows how to act. Yeah, this guy's a good actor. Um, I hope it's the guy from Narcos. I can't remember anymore. I don't. I don't but it's definitely the guy from Logan. Yeah, yeah, it's the guy from Logan, though. And uh, so, I mean, they kind of stripped away his charisma a little bit. I understand why, because you kind of need a blank slate so someone can put themselves into it. Um, I think stories need to kind of go away from that, though. I think people want a rich lead. Yeah. Yeah, I think the days of the blank slate lead character are over. I think we need to move on past that. We need, yeah, just, we need a rich lead character to 
follow along with the rest of the movie. Keegan and Thomas Jane are really fun to watch interact with each other. Yeah, it's an amazing duo. I I love I love Thomas Jane's casting in this movie. I think Thomas Jane fans are gonna fucking hate it, but I love it. And I'm a Thomas Jane fan as well, but I think like the macho machismo, I love the Punisher. Thomas Jane fans are gonna hate this, but I think I think uh, this is a great natural progression for him as an actor to sort of be like a funny sidekick. Well, he actually gets to be like show off his character actor chops. Yeah, and he's fucking awesome in this. <laughs> and it also matches the inappropriateness because he has I don't even think this is a spoiler. He has uh, Tourette's. Yeah, and of course because it's a Shane Black movie, everything he says with Tourette's is like disgusting. Well he's the, And it's funny. It's it's, funny it, it's Shane Black's pussy character from the first one. Right. Like he gets to say all these inappropriate things and he's like, oh it's not his fault. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's got Tourette's yeah. and so that's inappropriate. That's what I want. I don't want this to be... I want this to actually insult people in certain times. N- not the kid. The kid and everything that has the autism... Um, that's not a spoiler, right? No. Okay. So the kid that has autism, leave him out of it. Don't don't have him part of the insults or anything. But these grown-ups, these grown-ass men, just lay waste to each other. And yeah, I think that's, that's they mostly did. For. Yeah, that's what I'm signing up for. I want to see these adults rip each other apart. And they, they do, but I needed more of it. <sighs> you know what? It, I still okay. really liked it. And as for a series that I, I am not that invested in, because even the first movie is not one of my favorites. I think the first movie's fun, but I don't think it's perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Oh, I, I, I think the first one is a perfect <laughs> action sci-fi movie. I've told you this. I watch it on repeat about every three to four months. Yeah. And a lot of kids did. For whatever reason, I just don't have a connection to it. I so, still like, do. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, Plus, I don't have that with this, so I yeah. didn't... I wasn't so invested in this movie that like I was like, well, it's not the original. Because to me, all of these movies are fine. You know, like, so this one was like, oh, this is pretty good. I had a lot of fun with it. I didn't feel like, you ruined my franchise, which I think a lot of people did feel like, and I think that's stupid. And I heard people say they ruined the franchise with AVP2, and I'm like, bullshit, they can still make money off this. It's yep. coming back. Yeah. And then he did with Predators, which was okay. Uh, I personally, I like the Predator 2018 right now better than Predators because... <laughs> of the dialogue i got the inappropriate dialogue i didn't get enough of it i wanted more but i want my predator to be half comedy half sci-fi well i guess i should say a third action a third comedy a third sci-fi yeah no this is the best sequel in my opinion for sure because it gave me all the things i needed in a predator movie so room for improvement but we've gotten I got everything I needed. I just needed more of it. Yeah, the second one was just flat out weird. Yeah, that's just a goofy ass movie. And it's one of my all time high guilty pleasures because when you watch it, you're like, what the fuck? Yeah, I own it. I like it. I've, I've watched it a couple times. I've seen it a couple times, you know? Yeah. So, like, I don't hate to. It's just a fucking weird experience. <laughs> well, I think, like, this film and all the films that follow the number one, you're all screwed. Yeah. Because you're never going to beat the first and you're always going to be compared to it. So it's kind of like if I was a, obviously me right now, I would take a new Predator film because I'm like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. You're going to give me how much money? But if I was an established filmmaker, I would not want this franchise. I'm like, nah, I'll go for something else. Yeah, like there's there's better franchises to pluck from, you know, more to develop. Like this one, you're screwed. You're screwed, yeah. and no, you're no matter what. And we're learning this with this one. No matter what you do, people are gonna hate it. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right, we'll end uh, this podcast, and we'll say what we're doing next month, and then we'll go into. I just I gotta get a spoiler out of the way on this. Okay, so do your, do your We still okay. have to do a museum and. Yeah. For this too, but. So uh, let's go into the museum. Okay. This is the second time I've had to reclaim my property from you. That belongs in a museum. So do you. This is the part of the show where we put something good or bad in the museum. And I know it's been like sandwiched between the movie review and and now <laughs> Predator. But uh, I do remember what I wanted to put in it. And what are we putting in the museum this week? I'm going to go first because I just know. I'm going to put something negative in. 
And I hate to start Stephen King month with something negative, but I feel with this one, it kind of forced me. The negative with this is you cannot make a horror film boring. It's like the ultimate sin, in my opinion. You can make it bizarre. You can make it over the top. You can make it slow, but it has to be entertaining. Yeah. Like, there are slow burns that are entertaining because they, like, slow burn to something big. Yeah, this isn't not a slow burn movie. This is just a boring film. It's boring. Yeah, it's, that it's, is the difference. Like, don't do it. It will always ruin your movie. And if you're going to make a boring film, you better at least have a character, a lead character in the film that is likable. Linda Hamilton and this, I don't know, what is Peter his name? Horton. Peter Horton. I don't like either of them. The entire town could have burnt with them in it, and I don't care. Yeah, I don't care about these characters. I don't think they should be together. I don't want to watch them for 90 minutes. I don't like these characters. I don't care. I don't like them yeah. individually. I don't like them together. Doesn't matter. Like, I don't like these characters. And they could have done the lazy thing of him, like, hiding a ring in his pocket and pretending to, like, you know, I, I I don't want commitment and everything like that. But all the audience knows, like, oh, he does. He yeah. does love her. Yeah. He's just waiting for the perfect moment. Nope, they don't do that at all. He's a dick. He sucks. Yeah, like, what would have been a good cheap way to do that is he's having, he has the ring. He's, you know, doing like you're saying. Like, yeah. Acting like he doesn't want to commit. And he dies. That's your easy drunk drama. Like, that easily makes yeah. the movie more memorable and it's just an easy easy writing trick like it is just the easiest trick in the book but you're immediately more invested and even if you don't like the characters besides that you'll remember that so like that is the easy fix for this movie that they just did not do (laughs) all right matt what are you putting in as much as i do agree with you that this movie is boring there are some bright spots and i think the main bright spot is isaac in this movie Uh, John Franklin's performance is wonderful. I think his performance deserves to be recognized. And I think think it's kind of cool that he is sort of a horror icon now. Oh, yeah. Isaac is like one of the icons of horror on like a sort of a second tier, but like he's in there. And I think it's deservingly so because his performance is great and the character is great. And I love that opening scene with him just like creepily staring in the window as all the kids go kill all the adults. It's really great. Oh, he's by far the best in this film. Yeah. He's, he's the highlight. He's the star. For sure. Yeah. And, he's, and he's great. So, yeah, I, that's that's the bright spot of this movie. Uh, pretty much, and this is just overall, this is sort of, the, I'm out of the museum, this is sort of just my overall thoughts of this. The stuff with the kids works for me. There's just not enough of it. They're, the stuff with the adults and how long they spend with Peter Hort and Linda Hamilton is just, ugh, it's exhausting. You give me just the kid's story, and you just sort of throw these adults in there, I'm more interested. Yeah, I think if the kids would have led uh, like they did in Goonies here, it'd be more interesting. Problem is, kids are hard to direct, and I'm assuming a smaller production company like New World probably was like, uh, uh, it was probably hard to keep the leash. Let's on. let's throw some adults in here to lead it. The kids or side characters are a little bit easier, but you know, if you're gonna make a good film, sometimes you gotta sacrifice. So, yeah, it's not this as a whole. This does not work for me, and it's kind of sad because I didn't want to start off Stephen King's month like this. But I promise you, we're going to get to better. Yeah, it's going to get weirder as we go on. (laughs) And and what is our next one? So next week, we are taking a look at Graveyard Shift. Oh, great VHS cover. Can't wait to get into this. 1990. (laughs) Owned it for several years. First time watching. All right. I've watched it. We'll talk about it. (laughs) Okay, remember to rate and review us on iTunes. We are also on... Podbean, YouTube, Google Play, anywhere you get your podcasts. We are there. Take a listen. Give us a download. We love you. Put us in your ears. We do. We really do appreciate getting comments on YouTube and interacting with us on Facebook. It's a lot of fun. And uh, so we'll end it off, and then we're going to go into spoilers. So remember to be kind. And rewind. Okay, you can stay. (laughs) The rest of you gotta go. Because we're gonna spoil this. Okay, are you gone? Good, let's go. Um, The whole present at the end, 
that predator that comes out of that suit. That sucked. Yeah, I liked it sort of better as the MacGuffin where you don't know what it is, where it's just like the Predator brought a thing that's going to help you with the other Predators. Leave it there. Don't open it. Don't show me. Like, the way they build up showing it to you is almost as if it's going to be something we recognize, and it's not. It's basically just an Iron Man suit. I, I like, oh come on no. I thought it was gonna be like how to create a predator and human hybrid that was like a super fighting machine, but like small and agile or something. Yeah. Like just like oh you know this is how you can create a predator or or something. <laughs> when it was the suit, I was like, oh that is lame. Yeah, it's it's Iron Man. It's just an Iron Man suit. That sucks. And Shane Black already did an Iron Man movie. Like, Which half the people in the U.S. hate. I love it. I actually, yeah. I, love it. I fucking love it. I think I, I told you this. Uh, I rewatched it uh, several months ago. And if you take away all the marketing trickery and all that and just watch it. And also eliminate, like, if you're... If you're stuck up on you love the Mandarin character from the comic books, well, then you're never going to like it. Forget yeah. it. Gone. Just just give it up. But if you're like me and I'm not into the Iron Man comics <laughs> and just don't care. So I don't really have a huge I, I don't have any connection with the Mandarin. So I just watched it and I was like, oh, this is interesting. I love it because I, I, I don't have, the, I guess, the connection where I like needed to see the Mandarin on screen. But also at the same time. If I did have a knowledge of the character, I think it's brilliant that it was, like, a gag. Like, it was a thrown, like, you know, this is a spoiler for Iron Man 3 now. <laughs> like, uh, well, sort you, of, like, uh... They've the had that, enough time. Yeah, that's true. The twist that Ben Kingsley is not the Mandarin, I thought it was brilliant. I was like, that is such, like, just a fuck you to expectations. Because the problem with all these Marvel movies, I've said it before, is everything's so predetermined. You know everything that's going to happen in all these movies because they are literally I, telling you. I, and this was the one time they were like, nope. <laughs> I think that's the problem is when Marvel has done something different, people don't like it. So they have to stick to their script that's going to make them their money. Because I'm sure Iron Man 3 made money because Iron Man 2 was shit. Yeah. No, Iron Man 3 is one of their biggest hits. So I, it was critically half and half. I, I, I liked it. Uh, I revisited, liked it more. Um, again, no connection to it. I love that they did something different. They tried. Sadly, I don't think that's ever going to happen again. But but they tried something different with Ga- Guardians of the Galaxy, and they nailed it. Yeah, that was it one. They did something different, and it worked. And that's and because there's something different, those are why those are my two favorite Marvel movies: Guardians of the Galaxy and Iron Man Three. Because they're the different ones. They're the ones that tried something. They're the ones that didn't just buy into the formula. Yeah, I, man, that would be tough to list all these out in order because there's just too much. Oh, I was bored at work one day and I did it with my coworker and it was great. <laughs> oh, all right. It was really cathartic to like sort of list all the Marvel movies and rate them and like uh, so was, shit talk some that people love. It's fun. Was Thor 2 at the bottom? Boulevardless. Yeah. <laughs> Thor 2, Iron Man 2. Oof, but Thor like, 2. Then my controversial choice right at the bottom was Captain America 2. Winter Soldier. Oh, yeah. I know everybody fucking has such a boner for that movie. I can't stand it. Well, I don't have a boner for it. I was just like, no, it's it's good. I don't think it's the best. And I've heard people get mad. At, not get mad, but they're just like, you don't know what you're talking about. I mean, it's my opinion. I yeah, do know. I, I, I know. I know my opinion. Yeah, I know that. Like, I don't like this. Like, I much prefer the first one because the first one is fun and uh, the Captain America movie. So that was higher up on my list. But uh, yeah, it, it is interesting to kind of compare and you know get the get the Marvel movie fans all riled up when you like don't like something that all of them like. <laughs> I saw Ant Man and the Wasp, and I don't even remember half of it. Yeah, same. It's just like gone from. Yeah, I'm like, I was like, oh, right. I, that's a movie I saw. Yep. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Uh, speaking of goodbye, I think we've done enough with the spoilers. We've made good time on this, so we are going to shut it off again. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see you back for Graveyard Shift, everybody. Hey, do you guys like horror movies? I do. Do they always have to be good movies? No way. I prefer them to be crap, personally. Well, then you guys are in luck, because Horror Movie Night is your expert podcast on both horror movies, good, bad, and gooey. 
It's just a show of three friends. Brother. Yeah, two brothers and a friend, I, I think you would call. But we're also, we're all friends here. You know, we're friends. We we're all around. friends here. Yeah. We're friends. We goof around. But we, we, talk about, we talk about movies, but we normally don't actually talk about movies, which is kind of weird. <laughs> it's, it's a weird dynamic. You have to really listen to understand it. But we put together a show every Friday morning. You can find our show, hmnpodcast.com. Uh, we're part of the Geekscape Network. We are... You know, we're good guys. You should check us out. We're good, silly guys. We're, we're fun. Please like me. Please. <laughs> That's pretty Please. much the impetus of everything we do is to be accepted. We want to yeah. be loved. HMMPodcast.com.